and it is my great joy to uh, re-welcome Tracy Deer back to Q. How are you doing? I'm really, really good. I'm really excited to be here. It's um, it's an incredible time. I mean, this film has one been 30 years in the making since I lived it, but but also it's been about a 10 year process to finally be here and, and presenting it to the world. So it's surreal. It's exciting. Um, I, it's so many different things. All at once. <laughs> yeah, it's surreal. It's exciting. It's exhausting. It's, it's all those ter- things. It's also terrifying. It's terrifying as well. It's terrifying? <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, how will it be received? How will, you know, we, we all, all of us, uh, we all, we have great hopes for the film and the kind of impact it can have. And so will it have that impact? Um, I, I want to play my part in making the world a better place. That's the big goal. And it's very idealistic, I know, but, you know, will the film, can the film do that? Uh, and now we're at the phase where we're going to find out. So that's the terrifying part as I guess, an artist. I guess it's terrifying too, because it's so, it's so personal. So oh. uh, as much as you want to say here, but like how, how personal or, or autobiographical, like how much of you is in this? So the emotional arc that the character goes on, the journey of self-discovery, that is definitely pulled from my own journey. But my journey did stretch from 12 into my early 20s um, until I I was at a place to really own who I am. Um, and, And for the film, I did condense it into this summer for this young character. And there are very specific scenes in the film as well that are ripped directly from my memory, but I didn't, I wasn't at all of those landmark um, Oka events. Mm. Uh, So I placed my fictional character there in order to move the story along. But the big one would have been um, when all of the cars left the community and we were pelted by angry Quebecers with stones. That one, that one was directly from the way I lived it, and mm. I, I really wanted people to experience it the way, the way I did. And so I, it's it's shot that way as well. Yeah, and I, I, we'll talk about this in a second, just a little bit about the impact of reliving something like that. But, but um, I heard back then you knew even then you wanted to tell the story. Like even then you were kind of like, I'm one of these days I'm going to make a film about this. Yeah, so I was 12 years old when I decided I wanted to be a filmmaker and I had just lived through the Oka crisis. And yeah, even even back then I, I thought this, this needs to be a film and it needs to be a film told through a child's point of view because the way I lived it was so different than the way adult, uh, Mohawk adults lived it, but also the way Canadians lived it. Um, I didn't know everything going on. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't being told. I mean, the information wasn't, and as it, I, and I don't know that it should have been, you know, I, it's not a, it's not a big criticism to the adults to not be explaining everything to us. I'm sure they thought they were protecting us and shielding us, and yet we were exposed to all of this, and it did have such a massive impact on me. Um, so I wanted to tell it from from the point of view of a child, and and the devastating effects these types of um, this type of racism, this type of violence can have on a on a child. You know, the, the, the Oka crisis is the subject of Ghana Satage, the uh, 250 years of resistance, Alanis Obamsawin, like legendary documentary, incredible documentary. It must have been an experience making this film or, or even just watching it and going like, yeah, there's that's me. There's there's my there's my family. There's that's something I, I, I went through. Tell me a little bit about the impact that film might have had on you in making this film. So I only saw that film, I was in my early 20s and I was in university and I was in a class and that's where I saw it. And I was ripped to shreds. It was really, the Oka crisis was something I compartmentalized and tucked away as a survival mechanism to get through my adolescence. And I barely did, you know, I did go through a very dark period of depression. I was suicidal. So, all of that was really tucked down deep. And then I saw Alanis's film um, in the middle of, of, you know, I was at Dartmouth College uh, and this film just came at me and ripped open that compartment. And I mean, I, I once, once Rocks at Whiskey Trench, which is what it has been termed, showed up on the screen, um, I ended up having to sort of leave the classroom and broke down in sobs in the hallway and the teacher came out confused what was going on. Um, so it, it had a profound, profound impact on me. And also that 
Elenisa Bumsuin is who she is and was there and made sure that our side of the story was told in that way uh, was just so inspiring to me. And, and, and not only that, in, your, in this film, it is um, a dramatic film. You know, it has actors playing these parts, but you also use actual, a lot of actual news footage from, from, from the day, um, which is illuminating in a lot of ways. You know, one is to see how the media portrayed it at the time. You know, um, uh, another way is to be a reminder to those who perhaps didn't live through this that this did actually happen. Tell me a, a little bit about using so much real footage in this film. Well, it's exactly what you've just said. Uh, there was multiple reasons to do it. One, for the longest time in the writing phase of this script, we were really concerned with how do we tell the Oka crisis story? There's so much that happened, you know, every day, some different things were happening and the script writing phase took around eight years. And for years we were balancing all these details. And, and ultimately the big real is the big aha came when I realized as a 12 year old, I had no idea all this stuff was happening. So if we wanted to be true to that story, then we needed to be more, our little girl needed to be more removed. However, for the audience to understand what was going on, they needed some context. For them to understand her journey, they needed that context. So those documentary moments, uh, those four pillars that we have in the film, they came into the script years ago uh, in order to give that context. And exactly as you said, for people to know that this really happened, my biggest fear was that if, any, if, if I didn't have them and people watch the film, which I think is a completely normal reaction when you get uncomfortable with your feelings to say, well, I'm sure that didn't happen. Mm. Don't worry, honey. I'm sure, I'm sure they're, they're exaggerating mm. for, for the story. And I did not want that to happen. That would have been, um, that would have, that would have hurt all over again, if that is what people were saying. So that is also my hope is that with these documentary moments, um, it's very clear that this happened and you cannot dismiss uh, the dramatic fictional moments of the film. Tracy, because you're telling, I mean, so let's let's talk about what you said at the very beginning. You said this was so incredibly hard uh, to even retell the story. And when you watched Alan Iso Bamsawin's film, you walked out and I mean, you were so incre- so impacted by it. So this is a challenging film to shoot, right, for a bunch of reasons. You know, it, it, again, it's so real. It actually happened, especially for so many indigenous people across the country, but particularly Mohawk on that territory who went through the Oka crisis. How do you go about shooting this film in a sensitive way without re-traumatizing the people who are in it, the, the land that you're on? I mean, talk, talk me through how you did that. Yes, and that was my biggest concern. And uh, you do it very, very carefully and very strategically. So I really hope we were successful. Um, so for, for a lot of the, the very ugly scenes, we did not shoot them in or directly around Ganawage. I did not want to rip the scab off of a wound that my own community and our neighboring communities have worked really hard over the last 30 years to repair. Mm. So I didn't want to inadvertently expose anyone to those terrible memories. So we ended up going a good 45 minutes outside of Ganawage to shoot the really, really ugly scenes. And those neighboring communities were very happy to have us. They knew what we were coming to shoot and they wanted to be a part of a, of a film that had the potential for reconciliation. So we had fabulous partners with these communities further out. Um, On our really tough days, we had social, we had some indigenous social workers on site to talk with anyone who was having issues. We had a PTSD specialist as well, not only for my main actors, myself included, and all of our Mohawk extras, but also for our non-indigenous extras who had to go to such an ugly place. Mm. Um, I wanted everybody to have the support they needed. We had an acting coach for all of the kids to help prepare them coming into the scene and also be there for them as they left the scene. Because I, as the director, I'm there for them as well. But I mean, I'm moving mm-hmm. every every day. It's like scene after scene after scene. So Malie Hutton, uh, our acting coach was there to help them emotionally prepare and help them emotionally deescalate. We also had an intimacy coordinator, Lindsay Summers, mm-hmm. who helped with the, the more sexually charged scenes. Um, yeah, we, we, and I, I, every day 
<clears throat> I love what I do. And for me, it has to be fun, as much fun as possible. Mm. And I really wanted that for the kids. So even though they were coming in to do these really difficult scenes, I wanted us to have fun every single day. And I worked really hard to, to make our set that kind of environment. Tracy, only tell me as much as you want to tell me here, but what about you? I mean, you, you told me that, you know, you, you had to, you know, you said it's not a strictly autobiographical film. You compressed a lot of stuff into this film, but you, you know, you were in the car and people were throwing stones at you as you were crossing the bridge and you had to shoot that scene. How, how was that for you? <clears throat> it was, um, it was terrible. <laughs> it was absolutely terrible. And uh, on the drive-in <laughs> to set that day, I thought, what were you thinking? What are you doing? Um, I thought I could definitely get like a masochist uh, title um, next to my name at that point. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so it was, it was very scary driving into set. But as I got out of my car and had to go to base camp and check in with my actors, um, I did, I, you know, that the, the survival mechanism of compartmentalizing uh, is still active. And I was able to kind of tuck it away, tuck myself away a little bit, put on my director hat um, to be there for my, my actors and my crew and get the job done again with the bigger goal in mind. So if we could put the story out there, we could touch people with an open hearts, open perspectives, and it's worth it to, to do this for that purpose. Um, I did have some difficult moments through the yeah, day. Of course. Um, when we were first shooting with the kids in the car and had to go down that um, at one point, there's so many things that have to happen, including the windows going up. You know, when we, it was a hot, hot summer day and all of our windows were down. And as we were getting off the bridge and my mom was realizing what was happening in front of us, she started yelling for us to get down and she started putting up the windows. So that's what was, happens in the scene. And there's all these different cues as you're shooting. And I forgot to cue the windows. So we are now getting closer and closer to the crowd of angry protesters who are gonna throw rocks. Of course, they're not real rocks in, yeah. in the make-believe world shooting in. But it dawns on me that the windows are still down and I've missed a cue. So I yell cut, I apologize to everyone in the car. I missed the cue, I'm so sorry, let's reset. And I, and I say, stop the car. But the car wasn't stopping because we're being pulled by a rig. So not, I don't have a driver, I have a rig pulling the car. And there's a microphone in the car so they can hear everything I'm saying. And so I yell cut, stop the car, so sorry everyone. The car keeps moving. And meanwhile, my crowd of extras don't know that it's been cut. They don't know that there's been an error. So I did have my own sort of panic moment as the car continued to roll. Oh my. Towards this crowd. And I, I just kept, I started saying, stop the car, mm -hmm. stop the car. And the car wasn't stopping. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think I just had a, a bit of a, my own bit of PTSD moment. And I just really started yelling, stop the car, stop the car, stop the car. Right. Uh, and finally the car did stop. And um, I, yeah, every, and everyone in the car, my, our intimate car was looking at me and they were just like, Tracy, are you okay? And I, I had tears and I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm okay. Is everything yeah. okay? I'm so sorry about that. Um, so, you know, there was moments like that where uh, it was hard. It was hard to um, keep it tucked away. Hardest day, hardest day of my life. Yes. My uh, well, second hardest day. The first hardest day was when I lived it. Second hardest day was to recreate it. What a, what a, th thank you for sharing that. And, and what an incredibly powerful film. I just want to play a clip from it mainly so we can catch ourselves here a little bit and, and, and just take a listen to this. You want to go to Juvie? Hmm? Instead of Queen Heights? She started it. I'm sorry, what? Do you understand what is at stake here? If they hate us, we suffer. Our people suffer. And tonight, you made more people hate us. And rightfully so. You behaved just as badly as they did. She deserved it. They all do. Oh, don't you scream at me. That is not how I raised you. You are better than this. We are better than this. Pack your stuff. 
so we can get the hell out of here before they change their minds and they lock you up. I'm not going to that stupid school either. That's Deka Handagwa, who also goes by the nickname Beans, having an argument with her mother. Tracy Deer is my guest, the Canadian director. Her film Beans made its debut at the Toronto International Film Festival yesterday. Uh, Deka Handagwa is played by the actor Gyawan Dio. She's incredible, but she's a kid. She's how, I mean, how old is she? And uh, she's, she's, she's now 14, so she would have been 13 at the time when we, when we filmed. And you um, tell this story not through the eyes of an adult, not through someone holding a gun, not through someone um, facing the line. Like you, you tell it through a, a child. And it's also such a beautiful coming of age story, too, and a story about a kid trying to fit in, as we all did back then. But, you know, Beans is so integral to this story, like her growth as a child is so integral to the story. I wonder what we learn about, whether it's racism, colonialism, like the world. What we learn about it differently when we see it through the perspective of a kid, you know? I, I, hope, you, I hope you learn a lot more than just, um, as you said that earlier, the headlines. Um, I, I really wanted to humanize the experience. It is racism, indifference, injustice. It is so destructive to, to a person's self-worth, to a person's self, uh, sense of safety. Um, and I can attest to this personally. And I really think we need to do better. So I, I, I chose to, to tell the story through a child, really hoping to inspire people to go out into the world within the power that they hold, and we all hold power, to do better, to make the world a better place for our Indigenous kids. Because it, it, you, you, they need hope, they need their dreams, and all of that gets chipped away by the society that we live in today. I said this to you at the beginning is that I was born in, in 87. So I was born, um, the Yoka crisis, I was not something I saw on the news. It was something that I, I had to learn about later in life as a story. And your film kept it from being a story. Like I felt every, every moment of it, you know, I felt, I felt every single moment of it. I felt every bit of humanity as much as I possibly can, I guess. And, um, I, I want to thank you so much for it. Thank you so much, Tom. I really, really appreciate that. 